Hi there, it's me, Jordan Van Haslow. Welcome to Jordan Van Haslow and Friends live on Hot 702.5 FM Las Vegas. Let's get on with the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a brand new episode of Showtime with Jordan Van Haslow and Friends right here on Hot 702.5 FM Las Vegas. I hope you enjoyed last week's episode. It was our first panel episode. We haven't done anything like that before. I had such a wonderful time, and we're going to do many, many more of those. But we have not abandoned our traditional format of having in-depth hour-long conversations with wonderful friends of mine who work in various interesting areas of the business. And today we're going to have another one of those conversations with an old, 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 old friend. <laughs> from the crypt. <laughs> from the crypt. From the crypt. Um, I did this wonderful woman and I actually met because she um, was my writing teacher. From studying under her, it turned into a professional partnership and and then ultimately a friendship. And I'm so happy to have her um, on the show. And in fact, I think she's been wanting to be on the show for a long time. And she's like, why the hell have you taken so long? You have everyone else on the goddamn show. Why don't you bring me on the show? She's a playwright. What about me? What about me? Playwright. What about what I want? What about <laughs> what I want? Playwright, screenwriter, <laughs> teleplay writer, TV writer, teleplay writer, TV writer. Uh, she was nominated for an Emmy Award during her time working in the soaps on, um, you were nominated, your Emmy Awards for All My Children, right? But you worked oh, across right. all of them, right? So you were nominated for an Emmy Award for All My Children. She was, your short film, this is like a long time ago, but like you're at the Tribeca Film Festival. You, you Did you win the award for Best Adaptation or? No, it was um, or like selected. Finalist semi-finalist at the Tribeca Film Award for Best Screenplay Adaptation. She's done movies, theater, television, and we're going to talk a little bit about it. Um, she's partnering with the EAA to launch, well, has partnered with the EAA to launch a writing fellowship. My friend and soon-to-be your friend, Susan Sojourner Collier. I said, <laughs> It is so good to be on this, to be on your show. And I have to say how proud I am of you. Because oh. you just stay consistent with this. I mean, I remember when you started, when you were in Vegas, and um, you just stayed so consistent with this and just didn't let it drop off by the wayside. So kudos to you. Very proud of you. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you, my dear. So there's so much I want to ask you, but here's, I want to, I want to go back to the beginning. Not like, oh, but like, I want to go back to the beginning. So Susan Sojourner Collier, because like your sister, she has like a hyphenated name as well, right? Where does your Yaslin name come Priscilla. from? I'm, Yaslin Priscilla, right. So where does mm -hmm. your name come from? Where did Susan come from? Where did Sojourner come from? And like, what made your parents hyphenate them to? This is one of those questions that's so funny because like I've always thought it, but I've never like remembered to ask you when we were like together. So it's like now's a good time. <laughs> so um so my name originally was not hyphenated. Um, okay. I was born Susan Victoria. Victoria. Oh, yes. I could see you as Victoria. Victoria is oh, usually dramatic. Not. Victoria oh, Corey, not. Victoria Buchanan, all the great <laughs> Victorias of the soap world are very dramatic. So uh, my sister gave me that name. Uh, she's 10 years older than me. So she was nine going on 10 when I was born. And, um, and she and my brother, he was 11 going on 12. So there was this show, I think it was High Chaparral. And there was like this Spanish lady in it and her name was Victoria. And that's how I got that name, hated that name. I used to alter the spelling of it all throughout my life. It wasn't <laughs> until I went, um, when I finished college. And I was in school when um, I finished in 86. And that was the height of the whole, when, well, when the U.S., when I found out about the, um, the 
troubles, the, the struggles of apartheid in South Africa. Mm -hmm. So I um, went to a small black college, Talladega College, founded by slaves, and they bought the building back out the emancipation. And we had for um, our senior seminar, we studied different aspects of apartheid and we all did our research on it. So needless to say, when I finished college, I was like charged, like, oh, we got it in apartheid, we got it in all this stuff. <laughs> and um, my friends and I, we started um, a protest, shut the school down because the, the student loans were coming from the banks that had investment in South Africa. Mind okay. you, all of us who were leading the charge, none of us had through the laws. And we were like, <laughs> we got to stop this, shut it down. So when I finished college, I, I don't know how my parents could tolerate me because <laughs> I was a part of every um, student coalition against racism, um, stop apartheid now, um, the underground rebels. And when I look back at my date book, it was like every day I had like some kind of protest organization to go to. When I would see protests driving around Atlanta, um, I would see protests, people out protesting, and I would pull over, which I protesting about. Okay, let's get it on. <laughs> and I was like that shit. And in Atlanta, in an area called the West End, it was a lot of um, Africans there, West African people. And there was this small bookstore, black bookstore. And we used to meet there for lessons around teaching, teaching us the Kiswahili language. And that was a community of elders. And I stayed in the program for a year. And at the end of the year, they give you your, your name that the elders come up with. And they gave me the name of Sojourner, which meant spiritual traveling, because they saw that I would not stay in Atlanta long and I would move around the globe. Oh, and that's like that's how I got the name. That's so exciting! And so then you chose like you hyphenated it, and like you were like, "Hi, I'm Susan Sojourner." Yes, I despise the name Susan because I was like, "It's such a white girl name." Who you got, Susan? <laughs> I would ask my parents, "It's not like y'all had like a bunch of kids and ran out of names." <laughs> and then I even my whole writer's mind was, I would ask them, "Did y'all owe the mob money?" And rather than paying money, you name me after like their beloved aunt and they wiped off your your debt. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> what was it? I was like, but you didn't like the name. I was like, no, you didn't like the name. Well, but that I find that really interesting because do, have, did you ever find, I mean, because I know this just with my own name, I find it to be an advantage in the sense that like people are usually disappointed when I walk into the room because it's like Jordan right. Manhazard, they're expecting like a you know, Jewish aristocrat to walk in and it's like, hi guys. And so, but at the same time, I do think that my name has opened doors in a way that if my name was like DeAndre Watkins. Yeah. Like, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, it, it, like, like, mm -hmm. it, like my name will get me in the door in a way that other names wouldn't. I mean, so, I mean, being like Susan switch, Cuff, and, switch and a uh, bait type of bait and switch. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So I mean, like, like, me. like, did you notice a difference when you stopped being Susan Collier and you, you added Sojourner? Did you notice a difference in like anything? By the time I added Sojourner, so I was maybe like 24, 25, I was working at a law firm, but after that, I wasn't so much into corporate America. You know, I was trying to divorce myself from corporate America. Mm -hmm. And the only other jobs outside of that was, um, that I did was teaching jobs in Atlanta. And I got all that, you know, because of my parents. Right. So um, interesting enough, when I was, um, when I first started on All My Children, and I remember um, the lady who was responsible for hiring me, she just wanted my, my name for the credits just to be Sojourner College. She said, I want you to just let, let it be Sojourner College. I want you to stick it to him. I want you to stick it. She just so <laughs> wanted to see Sojourner College going up in the credits. And, like, oh. and I'm but sure I she was a to... Susan. We're going to turn Susan, like everyone's over Karen. We're going to make Susan. She was probably a Susan. Like, stick it to him. <laughs> I know, I know. And But my parents was like, Please ask Susan hyphenated so journey. So you know, I had to do what my parents were. I couldn't just put <laughs> some journey up. 
Because, you know, because my parents wanted to brag and, you know, they tell their friends, it's like, well, that does I see the collie, but I don't see no, the like, what's so, the I know, I know. <laughs> but I have cousins that's my age and younger. They insist on calling me Sojourner. That's which awesome. Is, I know. Well, it's weird, like, changing your name, right? Like, Jordan's my middle name. And I remember, like, when I started, like, like leaning in, because I always, you know, like, when I started leaning into using my middle name professionally, it was a weird thing because it was weird to like start calling yourself something that you're not trained to hear. You know what I mean? Like from the time you're mm-hmm. like a baby, it's like citizen, what? Citizen, what? Yeah. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like you know, mm-hmm. train yourself to something new. You have to kind of detrain yourself from like responding. Like anytime someone calls you by like your name you're not using anymore, you have to detrain yourself to like every time you're walking down the street and someone says Susan to not circle around or jump and also it's like the weirdness of like having to like explain to everyone oh this is what the deal and this is what I'm doing was it a was it a hard transition for you because it was, it was I, I just remember like going from my first name to my middle name was weird for me I know but you, you know when I met you I met you as KJ exactly and then um and then you evolved to Jordan for me and because different people call me just when I hear my name called the different iter- iterations of my name, then I know what what part of my history. Like that, in high school, I was Sue Q. So whenever mm-hmm. I hear someone say Sue Q, and I'm like, okay, that's someone in high school. Never called me Susan, nothing like, it was always Sue Q or just Q. And uh, um, when I was in college, strangely enough, and I was just so naive, my nickname was Fine, Fine Collier. <laughs> I had no idea, you know, didn't think nothing about it. And girls and guys. So when I was at when I went to grad school at Georgia State and some of my friends from college, undergrad, they were there and um, I was working at the registration office and I could hear them saying, oh, we're looking for a call you fine, call you please. And they were like, Who? <laughs> <laughs> and they still call me that to this day. <laughs> but when I hear soon I know someone from like age zero to 18. Uh-huh. So, you know, it's like the different. Yeah, the different times you're like, life. you're, 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 mm-hmm. you're right. That's so funny because I, I have that kind of same thing based upon what people naturally call me. It's like, oh, you're from this particular time frame of my life. So, right. and like when I hear Lil Collier, that was when I was hanging out in my dad's Bobby shop. So, everyone on Auburn Avenue. So, so yeah. So, you know, just the different. When I hear the different names, that's the different iteration of, okay, this person know me from that part of my life. Yeah. Oh my God. There's so much I want to ask you because we never like talk about like your your past or like, you know, like your life. Like I'm so you bring up Auburn Avenue and I'm so mad that I actually never met your parents. I still wanted to, I, like, I still to this day, I'm mad that I never did a duet with your mother here in New York City. <laughs> On the stage at like, don't tell mama. I but- know, but it was like they knew you because they knew like all of my friends and they were asked about all of my friends by name. You know, they knew like the age of all of my friends' kids. They could keep up with, especially my dad, could keep up with my friend's kids' age. Yeah. So, yeah. So, but like your mother was an actress, <laughs> queen, of the, queen of the Atlanta stage. Like, at what point was it, like, clear that, like, Sue Q, Lil Collier, Fine Collier, wherever you were at the time, what point was it clear that, like, oh, she's creative, and she's creative in a way that, like, it's clear that she's probably going to make this her thing, and how did that play out? I don't know if they knew that I was going to make it a thing, but around the age of um, 9 or 10, around the age of 10 or 11, because that's when I wrote my first adaptation of the book, Are You There, God Is Me, Margaret. I love the book so much that Is I just didn't want it to end. Finally, aren't they, they, didn't they just, but I think that they finally are, um, I feel like someone optioned it and they're they're trying to turn that into a film now. But I love oh. Judy, I love Judy and I loved, you know, the male counterpart. Then again, maybe I won't. I used to yeah. read that book over and over and over again. 
Like I couldn't, I mean, like I read, are you there guys, me, Margaret? But like, as like an 11 year old kid, like reading about periods wasn't exactly the thing, but like <laughs> there again, then again, maybe I won't. It was like, like that woman was, she's actually someone, I actually want to try to get her on the show. Cause she's, oh, someone, that she's getting older and, and she's someone who's such a seminal. And I'm thinking about this in light of like, you know, Barbara Walters passing this past mm-hmm. weekend it's like and she she's someone who was such a major part of not only like my life just like a specific point in my life as developing you know developing into the next stage of whatever it is so like anyways continue are you and here make you feel com- and make you feel comfortable with who you are and it's yes. so interesting when i went to spalding university to get my mfa Alan um, Davis Spalding. I'm sorry. I've never <laughs> forgotten about that. I still Alice need to name. create that character. Anyways. <laughs> Continue. <laughs> <just> tell- <laughs> and we had to write this essay on like the book that changed my life, something like that. So I wrote about that book and um, being 11 years old in the summertime in Georgia and living in an all black neighborhood. So you would think that, you know, I would, that book would not, you know, by this white chick would not resonate with me, but, uh-huh. you know, good writing is just good writing, period. And it crosses all culture, race, and all of that stuff. And it was a time in my life because I got hit in the eye when I was 10. Uh-huh. And I'm, I'm in and out of hospitals every summer because the doctor was like, we got to say that, we got to say that. And, I'm, and I was like, I'm just tired. What were you hitting the eye with? A rock, it was um, a freak accident, riding my bike, just, you know, on the side of the road, and the car ran over a rock in the ricochet. Oh, no. Like the freakish of accidents ever. Oh, wow. And so, you know, I was feeling very self-conscious, so I stayed on my block, but all the kids on my block, and you met some of them when you came to the fellowship, you know, it was just like business as usual with me. They never made me feel odd. But it's mm-hmm. just when I went like to school and wasn't around them, that's when I felt like, okay, I'm really weird now. So right. I rewrote the the book as a script. Didn't know anything. They hadn't read a script, nothing like that. I just knew that I wanted to see it up uh, mounted. And mm-hmm. they they were we had I had it in a composition book and we all did a reading of it. And they we were like pass the book around, you know. Okay, it's your line, it's your line. Oh, you miss your line. No, that's my line. So you know, we like read it all after me, Di, Lavelle, um, Vincent, and and it was such a big moment for me. And when I shared that in my essay in graduate school, I had this wonderful professor Sam Zaleski, and uh-huh. um, and he said, and why was that such a big deal? And I was like, well, you know, I was still in different. He said, no, and why else? And I was like, what is he getting at? He said, well, your dad is a minister. And it was the chick in the book, you know, reconciled with being a Jewish person. Uh-huh. And I was like, oh, I never made all of those connections, you know, the religious <laughs> part. Yeah. And I was like, wow, you're so smart. That's why you're about professor. <laughs> and, um, and, and that was like, what, 30 years later. You know what uh-huh. I'm saying? Make a new revelation about why that book resonated with me. So resonated with you so much, yeah. And I was like, that is so freaking cool. So it was like at that moment, I just I just like writing. And I just like taking something that someone else did in, in a book or a short story and making it something that could be performed. Not yeah. didn't have a name for it, didn't have any language around it because, you know, I was a little black girl in the South. <laughs> <laughs> trying to make it Jesus <laughs> but at my dad's church um, he allowed me to uh, um, you know they, I would write the Christmas play and um, and the kids would perform it because we had a lot of kids in the church but you know it was always like a different version of um, a Christmas care like the black oh, version oh god Christmas care short <laughs> version I just hate it because there's there's a handful of things that I hate. And the reason I say that I hate them, it's not that they're bad. It's just that I've like, 
seen or heard them so many times. It's like, there's no way you can make this fresh. So A Christmas Carol, top of the list. Cinderella. Cinderella. We know how it ends. We know they're mean, blah, blah, blah. Hate that. Uh, the song, My Funny Valentine. Like, there's nothing you can do to that song that'll make it fresh for me. I'm so, anyway, so like, but anyway, so you're doing a Christmas well, carol, yay. Well, let, let me tell you this. Um, with Cinderella, I use that as a teaching tool. Um, to do, tell them writing. to do something else? No, they do, um, they get in groups and I set it up as a writer's room. Okay. And it's like, um, the groups are like five, so it might be two groups. And they um, have to plan out five episodes of the Cinderella story. It started in the pilot. It started off with her going off Lose. with the prince. Oh, I thought you were going to say losing her shoe. But no, that's good. I no, guess she's going off, off with the prince. With, mm-hmm, and by episode five, she's going to jail. She's being locked up. Oh. Yeah. And students have come up with crazy stuff. One was she was a union organizer for the fairies <laughs> and you know and one she was drunk with power because the prince was like the mayor of New York. I mean they come up with all these interesting ideas but they got by the end of the last episode, episode five she has handcuffs on and it's so fun to see how they get there. Do you have one um, story that was like, oh my God, this is like the end all be all. Like, I, how did you even come up with this? Like, this is amazing. Do I have one with them? Like, like one, like one story, like of all the times you've given this assignment and you've gotten, you know, the assignments back. Is there like one that sticks out like, whoa, this is the wildest one in the world. And it was hilariously amazing. And I can't believe, like, how did you come up with this? Like, do you have one that was The like, one was the union. Out? The union one was really interesting. Yeah. And I could tell they really did their research because they had like a day and a night, you know, they worked together. And there was another group where she was a drug lord. <laughs> and oh my God, it's like, oh my God, all this time. What if, what if you actually are owed royalties for Queen of the South? Right? <laughs> <laughs> but embarrassing her being a drug lord because she was selling fairy dust. Um, <laughs> she, was, she was a drug lord all through the original story just that nobody knew. And they would do like flashbacks. Yeah, you know, like when she, uh, like when um, the fairy godmother came and turned everything into, you know, made her beautiful. Um, the flashback was that the fairy godmother owed um, Cinderella favor for the drugs, oh, okay. and that's why the fairy godmother did all the made her beautiful. But yeah, wow, that one was very, very interesting. That's so interesting. So okay. So, so, okay, so that's really fascinating. So what really, so like, okay, so yeah, Judy Bloom inspired you and that's what got you into your thing. But like, what's your, like, if there was no such thing as, you know, needing to pay a mortgage or rent or whatever, like you could just sit in a room and just do your thing for all eternity until you got bored. Like what, genre what like what really gets you so excited um i love long form storytelling okay series but genre i'm I'm talking like genre like do you love like romance do you love fantasy space do you like like what if you could if you could Okay, so like you think like a Norman Lear, right? The Norman Lear is known for what he does, and that's his thing. A Mel Brooks mm-hmm. is known for what he does, and does his thing. A, a Shonda Rhimes is known for what she does. If you could totally say, I'm going to do this, and this is what my legacy will be, and this is what will, you know, whatever. Like, what is that thing that really, really drives you or makes you excited? 
I, I think I will have to say, um, it could be any genre, but the character would be the same. Okay. And I love um, writing stories surrounding a black woman. Okay. Like a regular everyday black woman that that had not realized her power. For example, I wrote a play um, years ago, decades ago, but this was the play that got me my job on for the soap, that got me admitted into the fellowship, writing fellowship at Disney. And it was a play about a black woman living in the South in the 1940s that had several past lives and she remembered them all. And the people were, that was in her community were people that she had like, that she like really messed, messed over in the past life. And she mm -hmm. was trying to make a man. She knew that, but no one else knew that. Oh, wow. So, yeah, so stories so that, that surround a black woman. Um, but, I want, but I love having like the everydayness of a black woman. When Tommy Ford and I did um, the movie um, Conflict of Interest, it was a black, mm -hmm. black woman who was like high powered, uh, working for the DA's office, and she was married mm -hmm. and had a kid. But um, she gave up a kid for adoption when she was a kid herself, and it was her secret. But, um, and she had to make amends with that because now this person that might be her child um, is in trouble, um, and you know, they're gonna have charges pressed against them. So, but when we did the reading, and this maybe a week before, Tommy and I looked at each other and was like, man, what if she's visited by a spirit or like her younger self or a spirit of her younger self that she has mm -hmm. to make amends for? It's almost like when you're trying to keep this secret down and you don't yeah, want yeah. anyone to know this secret, but it keeps popping up, keeps bubbling up, and almost like you're playing whack-a-mole, like, get down, get down, get down. <laughs> <laughs> So and she's like, you know, fighting like hell to keep this secret. You know, she don't want her husband or her daughter to know because she's going to be this amazing person that has no flaws. But, you know, this thing is threatening her. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, so, so like regular women that um, I think they have like secrets. Secrets, yeah. Uh, the secret can turn to be like their superpower. I if they like don't know that. it yet. I want to I want to ask you about Tommy. So for those in the audience, Tommy Ford, actor, producer, director, probably most known for the so show Martin, right? And it was it was, I thought it was interesting about him, and I never met him, but he was one of those people like Joey Lawrence, like because in everything he did, he was always Tommy. Yeah, and now, Joey Tommy got the job and got a job. <laughs> <laughs> All oh, right, and the, and, the, and the Martin, it was like, yeah, he walked into a building, but like, what is that? How did you guys, mm -hmm. how did, how did you guys meet? Because like, what I, what I do know for sure, because, you know, Sojourner is an old, <laughs> but what I do know for sure that you guys had a really uh, amazing connection. And I just know that just from, I never had the privilege of meeting him, but just the oh, way that you would talk him. The way that you talk about him and the way that you, even during the time when you talk about it, it was like, there was clearly this really wonderful connection. How did you and Tommy Ford come into each other's lives and become, um, you know, uh, uh, creative mm -hmm. partners? Yeah, you would have loved him. We met through a mutual friend, uh, Romel Foster Owen, who is an amazing Oh, I know producer. Romel. I, I remember, I know Romel. Yeah, really cool woman, smart as a whip. And Tommy was looking to do, to get into producing and directing. And um, Ramel's the producer and she knew that I was writing. So this is towards the end of my tenure on the soaps. And, um, and I wanted to leave to do, to have more control over the stories that I got to tell. And Tommy and I worked together for a number of years before we actually got something off the ground. Mm -hmm. um, and, but we were very clear that I wanted to have characters of Black men that were like my dad, who 
loving, very sensitive, and that's the way Tommy was with his kids. And um, and have, you know, we both want to show like a loving black family that's mm-hmm. going through something, but they still love each other. They still face it together. Even when it looks like they're not going to make it. So we were both very clear about the type of character. So it took maybe five or six years before we actually got something off the ground. And trust me, we, I mean, it was like a princess kissing a whole bunch of frogs. Mm-hmm. One day we just sat back and laughed at the number of people that came to us with a project as like, okay, I got a million dollars. And then they have no money. <laughs> um, I mean, we met so many crazy ass people. I was one guy was buying a studio in Columbus, Georgia, because you know it was during a time where there was a lot of studios popping up. And he mm-hmm. took us to the place. We drove from Atlanta to Columbus, Georgia, two hours drive. But I have family down there, so it's like okay, I can stop by and see my aunt and uncle. He took it was um an old school building. I think he took us around. So yeah, this is gonna be the office. It's gonna be this. It's gonna be that. And we're like, okay, okay, so it's me, Tommy, um, our line producer, and another person. So we're looking around, taking pictures. About an hour, hour, maybe an hour and a half. And then we looked around, the guy disappeared, like times the source say. Never heard from him to this day. Wow. Didn't answer a call. I mean, yes. I mean, it was like crazy. So that went off about five years. I'm not telling you. You fire these people from the bus station, just like you know, the, the anger outers. <laughs> they tell you they got a story. They tell you they got two pennies. But yeah, maybe like five, six, seven years before something actually took off. Yeah. But um, but yeah, and um, and even during the time when I went to uh, Abu, Abu Dhabi, mm-hmm. Tommy was still going to see my parents. And I was oh. like, why do you keep, keep going by these? Well, if you will call more often, I won't have to go by. <laughs> <laughs> and what's so crazy is my parents never saw Martin. Ever? Never. Saw, um, never. Like- they thought he just Never, never saw it. Like the TV show, never? Like that was like a thing. Martin was like a cultural thing. They were not a part of that culture. Wow, they were (laughs) watching like, they were like a CBS watching like Murder, She Wrote. Masterpiece Theater. (laughs) (laughs) And they thought he was the, the nice young man that's, you know, that's working with their daughter. And at one point, um, my mom's car died. It just like clunked out. And um, I was home in Atlanta. I was going to different car dealerships to get my mom a new car. And my mom and dad thinking cars cost the same amount as what they cost in the 60s. So I was like, no, <laughs> that, that is not it. And you know, they didn't want to have a note. They wanted to pay it all out. And um, the, co- the car costs more than like their house costs when they bought it. And they're like, what? <laughs> right. They were like, no, nope, no, nope, that's not gonna happen. So um <laughs> one day I was I was home with Tommy called me on the phone and I was like being real snippy with he's like, What is wrong with you? I was like, listen, I spent eight hours at a different car dealership with my mom and dad. They drive me crazy. He said, Is it a car your mom wants? I was like, Yes, can you help us? You know, being all smart as he said, give me a minute. He called a friend of his who had who owned a car dealership right outside of Atlanta. I told him oh. how much my parents wanted to spare. And the guy called me that he's like, I got the car for your mom. And we went there and the car was like sitting right out at the lot, all wise. The amount of money my mom wanted to pay, perfect car for her. So then my parents started thinking, oh, so Tommy got the car dealership. Oh, how nice. So he was the young man who had the car dealership. <laughs> and that car is still running. We call it, the nickname of the car is Black Gal. Black Gal? Black, Black Gal. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's a little, 
a, a Honda, Honda. I forget. It's a little car. <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah, but they said they figured it was Tommy's dealership, and he got the car fixed, got the right car for them. Yeah. And um, so yeah, they was like, oh, he's like, oh, we didn't know he owned the car dealership. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> That's amazing. Even when they were in the nurse, when they were in the, um, the assisted living facility, Tommy stopped by. I was supposed to meet him there. I was late and he hanging out with them. And all the, all the other old people knew he was Tommy from Martin. And my dad was like, no, he's a young man that's the directing my daughter's play. That's who he is. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and he amazing. owns a car dealership. And he owns a car dealership. Like Scotty Pippen. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and they just I, loved him. They thought he was the bee's knees. I want to kind of go back to just you and your career. At what point, and maybe you still don't feel this way or whatever, but like, it, like it, I'm just curious, like at what point did you feel that you're like, Oh, I've crossed a Rubicon in my career. Like, I don't know if it was getting hired in soaps. I don't know if it was Tribeca. I don't know if it, like, what, did you, or, or have you ever had a moment where you felt like, oh, I've like crossed a Rubicon. Like, this is no longer a hobby. Like, people will no longer see this as a hobby. People will see me as I am a writer. Mm -hmm. Hear me roar and numbers too big to ignore. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, you know, I, I, so before soap, before I became a soap writer, I was fine with being a playwright and um, I was here, I got moved to New York City, I was cool with being a playwright and I had a part-time job teaching teensters how to read. I was mm -hmm. working like from six to eight, four days a week. And I was very, very happy with that. But, you know, like after, you know, once I got hired for the soap, once I got hired for the fellowship and then for the soaps, it was just so, you know, life still goes on. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're in the middle of those moments. And like all the turmoil that happens in your world, it doesn't stop. Uh, when I was, um, when I started the writing fellowship, I was in a very toxic relationship. I was engaged to this young man up in the Bronx and I was with him just because he had money. I was thinking just, just in case this writing thing doesn't take off, <laughs> which is the worst thing to do. And I would, all you listeners out there, Never hook up with someone just because they got money. You don't think you're going to make it because it will come back. And Unless you yourself. don't have anywhere to live and you need somewhere to like park your bags until you find your next no. place. I'm just saying no. like. Well, okay, well, I'll, I'll tell you this in that case. So we was in this beautiful brownstone in the Bronx and he hated the fact that I was um, writing for the soaps and fellowships. So it was like all of that chaos. Mm -hmm. going on and I'm still in the fellowship and just going to there you know it was it was a way to get out of the chaos that was in my home yeah and when they told us that there was enough job for all of us I was like okay cool so I can just have fun and just explore writing because I have all these amazing writing teachers coming to, to meet us every Monday and mm -hmm. I could just have fun with it so it was just, I had to be laser focused. And when I left him, I did not have a place to stay. So I'm like couch surfing. I'm like writing my episodes in diners because I didn't have the time to actually go and look for a place because you have to write like, well, I had to write 10 hours a day. Mm -hmm. So I'm like going to different people, standing in the Bronx, standing in Brooklyn, the girlfriend's sofa. Um, and her place was like a dorm because she had two guys that was in college staying there with her. And mm -hmm. staying with another friend um, on, uh, in Hale's Kitchen in this tiny studio. 
um, she was gone to Chicago to do some work. She was a set designer. So I was like house surfing during that time. And it wasn't until someone said, okay, someone has a brownstone and they've written out the top apartment. And I just went to that lady house with the cat. <laughs> and <I was> like, <laughs> You're like, I need to be somewhere. Like, just here. Like, you know <laughs> I don't have time to do no back and forth. Are you going to rent it to a not here? Uh, you know, the first two months of rent. She was like, wait a minute. I was like, I got shit to do. So, <laughs> so, you know, like to be in a space to say, okay, now I have arrived. I never had that opportunity to do that because it was just so much shit going on. Yeah. And, and, um, and which was really good because I didn't have time to think about, are they really truthful saying that it's enough jobs for all of us? Are they lying to me? What do I need to do to connect? I did not have any space for that. You just did and the work and was just like moving forward. Just do it, do my work and do it for it. Yep. And when they gave me notes back, I would rewrite the notes and categorize them, so, you know, into character, story, formatting. Yeah. And then I would mirror it back to them and say, okay, you said I wrote Mateo too soft. Is this a good example of hiring him up? So I would already have the examples already written. So it was like, I mean, I treated it like a real class. Yeah. And so, so, so with that said, stuff. that's so interesting because you said a character formatting. What was the third? And story. And story. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, and this is just like it's, it's, it apropos to nothing. But I'm just so curious. Most of your notes. Where did your note? Which, which of those three categories did most of your notes fall into? Character. Character, character voice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because some is of the it, characters I did not had not clicked into their voice. What's that like? I mean, I don't want to turn like go into a long conversation about soaps because soaps are like it's like it's not. I bet I'm just so curious. What's that like to like plop into a show? Like someone who might plop into like the Law and Order or uh, what's another yeah. one? Grey's Anatomy. Like where there are these voices, these characters that are long established, and the audience has been there from the beginning, and you as a new writer are like. Hey, I'm Erica Kane. Here's what you're doing today. Like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. what what is that like? It was stressful, but if I could go back in time and give myself a piece of piece of advice, I would say, you're going to get it, but you're going to fuck it up, and it's okay. Mm -hmm. Because I did not give myself the space to mess up and I'll be very, very hard on myself. But it's the thing, it's like an ego thing because as a new writer, for all new writers, no matter how much you study the show or the scripts, it's a tall order to say that a new writer gonna come in and get it right the first time. That's mm -hmm. just the ego thing. Because yeah. the people who are in the trenches working it, they, I mean, I can't know more than they do because they've been dealing with this for a year or 10 years or however long. So they know that they know the characters more intimately because they're putting words in their mouths and I haven't gotten to that point. Right. I'm just playing around with it, you know? So, yeah. so it's just the, the point of giving myself the space to continue to learn and be okay with it. And I remember my, uh, my mentor back then, this wonderful, wonderful lady, Molly Fowler, she kept saying, oh, she, she, she was doing God's work. Because I know I would come into her office cry. I don't know what the hell I'm doing. Uh, and she's like, you're not there yet. Script rise, you're not there yet. Give yourself space. And it wasn't until later on that I got it that I wasn't there yet. Because yeah. I didn't know how to use everything in the room. You know, like if the scene is taking place in Erica's bedroom, I need to know everything that's there. That right, I like, use. oh, there's a the bottle of lotion, lotion and she just like yeah. starts putting lotion on her hands to this. And yeah, just, and really yeah. live in the space. And that's what I tell my students when they're writing. And we do an exercise. Um, and I might have like some um, a, a, a scene taking place in the classroom. And, and I would have them to close their eyes. It's okay, what's in front of you? And they yell out. I said, what's the next? I said, and don't open your eyes. You got to imagine it. 
what's on the left hand side? What's on the right hand side? Okay, now turn all the way around and what's behind you? And I tell them when I'm when I am picturing my setting, I like actually turn my big head to the left with my eyes closed <laughs> and record what's there, you know, what's in front of me and record what's on the right of me. What's, and I get up and I turn around and I turn my body around to look back, look behind me. I feel closed, but I have to imagine what's in that room that I can use and I record myself. And now I know what all the things are that I can use to make the scene live in that space. Yeah. 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 And plus it's fun. Yeah, because it's it's imagine I mean, like again, it's just imagination, right? Like you you yeah. you get to imagine for a living. It's like everything that you did when you were like eight during summer break. It's like, okay, let's play make believe. And so now here's what's gonna happen. The or drunk like banker is gonna grade. rape his wife. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what? It was like me when I was in the second grade. I did no work in the second grade. I would just look out the window of the classroom <laughs> and just imagine everything, like Martians coming down. I did no work. <laughs> I should have been kept back. <laughs> My mom was gonna pick me up. She was like, did she do any work? The teacher was saying, Miss Blue Allen. No, Miss Blue no work again. I was like, why you back me out, old lady? <laughs> So what? No, she did no work. Well, so what's next for you? Like, if 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 I could say, here's like a magic wand, or here's a magic pen, and if you write out what the next step is for you, it's gonna like manifest itself. Like, what in a perfect world is like mm -hmm. kind of like the next step of your evolution as a person, as a writer, as an artist, as a human being? Like, what's your I love that well, food manifest. I love mm -hmm. that. I, that's what that's what I've been doing in my journal. Um, every day I write my meta, manifest list of things that's going to happen. Um, yeah. Well, um, as you know, I'm working on a script about the women in Atlanta in 1881, the laundry women that went on strike, the first strike of Black people. Mm -hmm. Very excited about that. Wrote out um, a short version of it, but um, I just need to write the feature, but I want to shoot the short version of it. And I've been researching this for about, about five or six years. So that's one thing. And creating more stories, producing more stories about historical women that we that I didn't know anything about. Mm -hmm. You know, when I go like, oh, wow, these women went on strike? What? Yeah. They shut down the city? They sued the city. I mean, it was it's in, incredible. And the city said, okay, um, everyone has to get a license to wash clothes. And it was like a dollar. And some of the women didn't have it. The women said, fine, we pool all our money together so every one of us will have a license to wash clothes. I mean, it's just this great lesson of collective work. Yeah. Collective work, collective effort. So that, and I've been wanting, I've been playing around with a course called social justice screenwriting okay so writing um scripts based on like playing around justice. with like putting together a co course like that yeah yeah I, i've been i've tested out this course in two different universities mm -hmm. and it's been really fun and how you know like bring an idea to them um we watched this as a class this is right before covid we watched this um documentary about of uh, Tiananmen Square um, and about the guy, they call him tank guy, that stood in front of the tank and he had like his groceries with him and I uh, wouldn't let the tanks go. So they, so we did like this whole deep dive. So they didn't know anything about it, of course. So we did this deep dive and research. So they created this monologue coming from him. So they had to do research about what life was during that time. And for this <laughs> man, and where was he going? Where was he coming from? And what oh, motivated him to do that? Yeah, and we did another, um, we did a short piece on <clears throat> the coal miners, which is really interesting because it's black, white kids, and they knew nothing about this. And when they saw the document, they were like, live it. Like, we had no idea this was going on. So it's about the new black line that was happening. And they did um, all these short pieces, like 10 to 15 page scripts 
on um, a gentleman that had, on the person where the black line had interrupted their world. Mm -hmm. And so that's where it comes from, from, right? Like, like two different worlds kind of colliding or getting into each other's space and having to figure out, wait a second, what the hell? Yeah. And treat them as real people, you know, find the humanity in these people. Yeah. I, I, okay, so it's so funny. So when I, before we started our conversation today, I was like, oh my God, okay, I'm almost there. Give me two seconds. And then I thought, oh my God, that's like such a random thing to say. Give me two seconds. Because of course it's going to be more than two seconds. And then I thought I should have said, give me a moment. But then I was thinking a moment is probably like a measure of time. Because I'll never forget my ex-husband Richard and I used to go to uh, P-Town every year. We used to go to the Cape every year. And there was mm -hmm. this one restaurant. I can't think of the name of it my, right now. It's right on the pier. But above the urinals, there was always, every year, it was like this ad, ad that had like a hundred like random facts. And one of those facts I always remembered was, even though I don't totally remember the fact, but it was like, a jiffy is actually a, a like a moment of time. It's like a jiffy is like one one hundredth of a second or one one thousandth of a second or something like that. So then I was like, so as I was thinking that this is all going through my head, I'm like, I wonder what a moment is. So I Googled a moment and moment comes, a moment started in the medieval times. And even though we calculate time differently now, a moment is actually 90, around approximately 90 seconds. And I was, and then I was hmm. thinking like, that'd be so interesting to like, you know, cause we always talk about, there was this moment with this man. There was this right. moment with my mother. And I was that, uh, and so that made me start thinking like, that would be so interesting to see how to capture a story in a moment. Like in a page and a half, mm -hmm. how can you mm -hmm. tell this story? Anyhow, just you tell, you saying that made me think about that thought I had right before. I like that. Right, like it'd be interesting because a lot can happen in it. Like, because if you think about like when you're like mm -hmm. telling a story or when you're like speaking publicly, like if you're speaking, like giving a speech, a minute and a half is a long time. Mm -hmm. But it just takes, like you say, that ninety second, that moment for something to change in someone's world. Yes, yes. Oh, that's interesting. So anywho, that was the thought. You just made me think of that because that was literally a thought I had right before we started having our conversation. Let's make that happen. <laughs> <laughs> so we're almost out of time, Sojourner. I know. Let's, can we tell everyone about uh, the 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 uh, Jimmy and Mamie and Jimmy Collier Writing Fellowship? Really, really quickly. Yeah, right? In a moment. It is a <laughs> <laughs> it is a, a writing fellowship to empower early career BIPOC writers to help them launch their career. So the first thing will be a writing competition, playwriting competition that will end the 1st of February. And the winner will get $1,000 and a reading of their work in New York City, and they will be brought to New York City. The reading by professional actors. And in the audience, people that can help launch their careers, like some agents and development people. So Excellent. yep, that's our first thing. I'm very Yay, excited about. So it. Where, where can they find where can they find it? What's the website? Um, www.collierwritingfellowship.org. Yes, Collier, yes, yes. C O L L I E R Writing Fellowship altogether. And you. You'll be able to uh, find all of the links and such if you come to the Showtime at Jordan, Showtime with Jordan, socials and web presence. I'm just, I'm just kind of freaking out right now because time passed so quickly and we have to sign mm -hmm. off. Thank you so much, Sojo. Please come Thank back. Thank you, my dear. Come back. There's so I'll much more to talk about. Thank you all there out in Radio Land uh, for continuing to join us. We've been around for almost three years now. And uh, we'll see you next Tuesday for another episode of Showtime with Jordan Van Haslam and Friends right here on Hot 702.5 FM, Las Vegas. Have a great week, everybody. Bye, everybody. Hi there, it's Jordan Van Haslow. Yes, that's right, that Jordan Van Haslow. I don't know if you know this, but 
everyone's favorite radio show and podcast is now available on Spotify. That's right. Showtime with Jordan Von Haslow and Friends, my weekly one-on-one -on -one chat with some of the most interesting people I know from entertainment and the arts communities can now be streamed on Spotify. Uh -huh, that's right. I share real estate with Michelle Obama. Click the link and be sure to subscribe.